I really wanted to just say thank you to everyone who's here, as well as the organizers, for coming to such an incredible conference. There's so much information and so much going on, and so many people who are incredibly passionate about what they do. Um, and we're all sort of swirling around this big, like, technology word, right? We're all, we're all techies. We're all in this. But there are so many different pieces of that and so many different side bubbles of this giant Venn diagram that I think it's amazing that so many people can come together from, some, from so many places in the world um, to share their insights and their expertise in these different areas. So let me introduce myself. Thank you, Ben. But I'm a journalist and a bioethicist, and my background as a reporter um, I spent a lot of years doing human rights reporting uh, internationally and in the U.S., and I focus a lot on policy um, and access. Um, but I'm also a bioethicist, so I have a master's degree in bioethics, and I write a lot about um, sort of the ethics of emerging technologies and regulatory systems that do or do not support them. So what does that mean? I work on... <clears throat> Like I said, regulation and policy of emerging science. So that is everything from established regulations for things like IVF. So that's easy. We know the rules. We know what embryos are. They grow in a dish. Then we have babies. We understand that. But what about what's coming next? There are so many technologies that don't yet have precedent. We still don't have laws or regulations around them. So we're building them. So I also look at the ethics of self-experimentation, which is something that is not new. Scientists have been experimenting on themselves for many centuries, but what is new is scientists who are experimenting on themselves with the express goal to enhance humanity and also doing it outside of establishment science and academia. So that's new. And then I bring all of that together and look at specifically distributive justice. And this is a big concept, but to me, it really means that the people who most need access to medical technology, health technology, or enhancement technology, whatever they want, should be able to get it. And that access to it should be equal. So, I think that biohacking is a really interesting place to start, and I don't think that I need to define biohacking for this group. We, there have been a number of people talking about biohacking. Um, but I will say that um, the movement is interesting to me because I see it as sort of a microcosm of many of the larger issues that face enhancement broadly. And so looking at biohackers is great because they are accessible and it's a tangible, um, applicable place to look. So when I ask Google what's biohacking, <laughs> It gives this definition, which is really terrible. This is like the worst bullshit definition ever, <laughs> okay? Because if the definition, if the general public perceives the definition of biohacking as acting without regards to ethical standards, right, which is what it said, or for criminal purposes, we have a huge problem. We already were starting off on the wrong foot, right? If that's the definition that people are getting from Google when they say, what's biohacking, then that's terrible because I think that we all know that that's not the case. We, we biohackers, I think, go out of their way to, although there's no official code of conduct, individually and together as a collective have said that they adhere to certain values and ethics, namely transparency, open access, sharing of technologies, and those are really, really important, especially because it shows this willingness to push technology and humanity to the very edge. Right, so I see two kinds of biohackers right now. There are two sort of parties, right? So one is the more community bio side, which has community labs, are more traditional scientists. Um, a lot of these are also not for enhancement purposes. A lot of these biohackers um, want to just encourage anyone with creative energy to sort of learn biology and get involved. Um, but they also, along with grinders, um, which is the sort of more traditional, when you say biohacker, this is kind of what you think of, both groups share this tenant of morphological freedom, which is the idea or the value that you should be able to do whatever you want with your body, right? And the thing about grinders, who are more anarchic, 
the New York Times used the word punk, which I don't think is necessarily appropriate, but you get the idea. Um, what's interesting about sensory augmentation and the biohacking community is that this is not for cosmetic reasons most of the time. This is, or never. Um, to be a cybernetic enhancement or a biohack, it used to, usually has four components. And so what I've identified is it needs to be a device um, or it needs to interact with devices. It is implanted. So not, we're not talking about wearables. Um, its purpose is for enhancing the senses or giving some kind of utility. And most importantly, it is for that one person. This person chooses to do an enhancement on themselves. It is an individual preference. And there are so many that you can choose from these days. Um, this is just a selection of them. Full disclosure, that's my hand. Um, but that's just your physical body, right? What about the insides of your body, enhancing the insides of your body? So I know that um, there was already mention of Josiah Zayner, who uh, used CRISPR on himself. It failed. Um, but the fact that he tried was really great. Um, maybe not the way in which he tried, but it would really push forward this idea of somatic enhancement. So when we say somatic, that means the cell, editing the cells of a living human adult. And especially what's important to me is that it's a consenting adult, someone who knows fully what they're doing, right? But then there's also germline modification, right? And we'll get to that. But biohackers, I think it's really important to say that they are not without ethics. And at a recent bio summit um, at MIT, we had 300 people who identified as members of the community bio circle or as biohackers, and we did an exercise um, where we put post-it notes on the walls, and this was one um, about self-experimentation, and it says, people should have agency over their bodies when experimenting on themselves. Innovation occurs when people are willing to take the risks other people would otherwise pass on. So again, I think it's really important to sort of take this is an example, um, biohackers sort of leading the scientific charge for enhancement of the human body. They're interested in evolution. They are definitely interested in ethics. And they're definitely interested in sharing resources, using an open source system, and being accessible. But it's also really important to note that just because something is open source doesn't mean that everyone who uses it is going to use it for good. So that brings us to a bigger term, which is enhancement. So when I say the word enhancement, what I mean is using technology to push the human body past its natural limit and not for a therapeutic reason. So there can be, as I've shown, genetic or cybernetic enhancement. But the enhancement debate really boils down to one really crucial thing, which is that some people can have it and some people won't have it because ultimately all of this costs money. And we're talking about the future, we're talking about biological inequality. And when we look at the society that we live in now, I think no one can deny that economic inequality has created these massive problems in our society. And just think about how that's going to be compounded when people are not only wealthier than others, but also are healthier. And the ways that enhancement are going to engineer divisions in our civilization. They're gonna re it's going to realign us, right? Socially, politically, probably religiously. Um, and this is a really, really important point. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? That's sort of what we're here to talk about. Um, and enhancement is where we're going. So ethicists like to say that there's this therapy enhancement divide, and I've mentioned. Um, I think that this gradient, where something is, you know, a medical necessity, so it's a therapy or a cure, gene therapy is a word we hear a lot, that that's acceptable. That's, an, that's ethically okay. We, we're okay to do that. Cybernetic experiments, mm, 
There's some questions about that. Biohackers are in the news all the time. People are a bit you know, wary of it. And then there's genome editing. And people are like, oh my god. Oh my god, unethical, unethical. No, we don't want to go there. We don't want to enhance humans. And that this gradient, though, to me, it seems really silly. It seems silly, because if you apply any other technology, the, the framing becomes really muddled, and the definitions become muddled. So think about a therapy, right, or a cure-ish for deafness, a cochlear implant, which is ubiquitous at this point. But let's not forget that cochlear implants can be worn and programmed by hearing people and might really change the way that people hear and experience the world on different frequencies. They can be hacked just like anything else. And who's to say that that technology can't be used by anyone who wants to use it just because it's not for a medical reason? So these are interesting questions. So we're talking about humans and enhanced humans, right? What it means to be human is going to fundamentally change if we fundamentally change humanity through our cells, right? But who gets to decide what and who the future looks like? And especially when it comes to babies. So we can talk all day about me wanting to enhance myself, but it gets really tricky when I talk about wanting to enhance my children, or your children, but not their children. So this is my baby. He's adorable, isn't he? I didn't make him with genome editing, <laughs> but he's really cute anyway. Um, this is a big decision because ultimately, like I said, what it comes down to is these technologies cost money. And when we start talking about making children and enhanced children a commodity, we have a really big question to decide because we can't undo this once we put it out in the world. We can't put it back in the box. Germline editing, the editing using CRISPR and other technologies of embryos or gametes creates changes in the human germline that are passed on. And to edit them out becomes unbelievably risky and raises a lot of other questions that we can't even get to yet. So the idea of using germline editing, when I first approached it and when I first decided like, wow, this is a big problem. How do, we, how do we parse this? How do we figure it out, right? How do we figure out what the issues are and what some solutions might be, right? And so before we can get to solutions, we have to look at the problems. So as a journalist, uh, I was always trained to look at anything with the five W's and an H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. So when it comes to enhancing what we're talking about, these are some of the technologies that are available now. So while these are not what you would think of as enhancement technologies, they are technologies that allow you to select for certain traits, which arguably is enhancement of our species. So sex selection of embryos, you can choose. You want a boy baby, you want a girl baby. What if everyone chose boy babies? What if in some societies where men are highly valued, make more money, face less discrimination, if you want those things for your child, right? What if everyone's choosing boys? PGD, this is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So this is to make sure that any embryos that you make using IVF, you only choose the healthy ones. You only choose the ones that are likely to survive. This can tell you that. Mitochondrial donation. This is the uh, sort of bizarrely named three-parent embryos that were recently very controversial in the news. So it takes the uh, genetic material from two women and one man to create a baby. So mitochondrial donation, just as an example. Um, we're going to talk about more. But first, let's talk about who gets to utilize these technologies. So I think that maybe a lot of you know that Facebook and some other companies were paying for their employees to have their eggs frozen, 
Would it be possible to make sure that your employees choose their best embryos? If your kid isn't sick, that means you get to go to work more, right? No, no staying home with sick kids, right? Who gets to utilize these technologies? Is it just parents? Is it companies? Is it countries? This week in the US, it was just announced that there is a new test for embryos that can determine IQ and that that's going to be rolled out because guess what? There are no regulations in the US on the fertility industry and what tests can and cannot be used to screen embryos. Other countries, Singapore, Japan is allowing germline editing they just announced. And what about countries with no regulations? No, no questions, right? Ukraine, Costa Rica, Mexico recently was involved in a mitochondrial donation technique. Who decides, right? So this creates then a crisis. If some countries are allowing it and some countries aren't allowing it and you want it, you're gonna travel for it. But who has money to travel and make a baby? Not everyone. Not everyone gets the choice or has the ability to travel to make sure that the baby that they have is healthy. So then we have to ask not only who decides and not only who's doing it, but who gets to buy babies, right? So I recently did a story about a fertility clinic in Ukraine where a doctor is uh, performing mitochondrial donation for, not for a medical reason, not for people who have mitochondrial disease, which is the only context in which it's legalized in the UK, which is the only country that has legalized it, licensed it, and is currently undergoing a, uh, experiments for it. In the Ukraine, there is a doctor who does it for infertility, or really for any reason that you want. If you want to pay him extra, he is using MRT, mitochondrial replacement techniques is the acronym, to uh, make babies. However, when I asked him about it and about whether he would do, use this technology for a same-sex female couple who wanted both parents to be genetically related to the child, he said he wouldn't because he doesn't believe in homosexuality. Private doctor, but he gets to decide who gets to be parents, right? And the fact is, regulators are not doing a good job keeping up with this science, and the people who want babies are gonna do anything to get them. Okay. So, then we get to the why, right? All of these problems, why should we do this? <laughs> it's creating this many problems, right? And why does this matter? I mean, if I just wanna live my simple life, why should I pay attention? And, you know, this seems so terrible, right? This seems bad on the face of it. But we can dig deeper. If enhancement has utility, and like I've said, MRT is not only for people who want to be genetically related to their children, it does start to create a, create a system where we're curing or factoring out or genetically cutting out terrible diseases from the human germline. This is ultimately, it's about health. And why does it matter? Because what if climate change starts to really affect the human body, but there ends up being a genetic way to make us more tolerant of a changing environment? Think about all the wars, all the famine, all the droughts that are gonna be driving climate-related migration. We're already starting to see this, but what if that doesn't need to happen, right? Ultimately, it comes down to the fact that this is already happening. So we should stop asking ourselves if we should allow human enhancement or when is human enhancement coming? It's already coming, it's already here. And so what we really need to do is ask how. How do we do this properly so that we minimize harm and maximize human potential? A lot of ideas for solutions, right? No one can agree on what path to take. And 
next week, it's going to be interesting to see there is a uh, very large conference happening in Hong Kong, which is the second international gene editing summit. The first one was in 2015 and uh, generated a lot of national bioethics councils to really engage with this issue. And they issued reports and a lot of nations were represented. And now the technology has moved so swiftly since then that it's going to be really interesting to see what comes out of that conference, which is happening next week. And there are some good examples. I mentioned the UK. Um, there's a really amazing system in the UK with uh, a regulatory agency called the HFEA, the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority, license every clinic, license every doctor, every technology, and embry every embryo in that country is accounted for. And it's great because this is an agile regulatory system that allows for new technologies to come through and pass through a system that has been created, and then a new technology comes, and it is accepted. It's tested. They know what's coming, and they're ready for it. But regulations are not the only thing that we need. We absolutely, constantly need to be striving to have efficacy, safety, and standards. And this is where we can look at the biohacking community again. Right? These are really, really important tenants that need to be at the forefront. Because even at-home experiments need best practices and peer review. Right? So we need to look at the ways that they are skewing corporate norms and establishment academia and create a place where all of these experiments all can be transparently shared with the public. Um, we need to more engagement with other people to pick, it, pick up the torch. There is really interesting science going on, and if you want to get involved, you should, to make sure that things are safe and efficacious. This is the point. But it's more than that. It's more than scientists getting involved. It's everyone getting involved. Stakeholders in the human germline are all humans, right? So not only governments need to be involved in regulating, scientists need to be better engaging with governments, biohackers need to extend a hand and start working, and the media, I'm sorry to say, needs to do a much better job in engaging with this science because this is not clickbait, this is people's lives. And we need to, together, create a common thread and realize that no one person is more important than another person and that distributing this kind of technology so that everyone has access to it is the only way we're going to minimize all the problems that everyone is afraid of. And that means that we all need to work together. We need to collaborate more all the time. Regulatory tools are representation, right? You need to talk to politicians and get mobilized about looking deeply at science that's happening now, right? It's ha it, people always ask for predictions, and it's so difficult to say because so many people don't even know that this is happening yet. There hasn't been enough attention to the potential that these technologies can bring us, and there's been a lot of fear-mongering. So unfortunately, looking at what's coming down for the future, for the next five years, I think it's going to be a lot of arguments. I think it's going to be an even more divided society politically, people who think that enhancement is unnatural, people who think that it's eugenics, people who argue that it's their right to enhance their children, that they see the world in a, in a way that they think it is their moral obligation to have the best children and give them the best chance. And these two sides of the debate are going to be really at each other. And that's, that's a fact. So unfortunately, 
I also think that because regulators are so far behind, it's unlikely that they will catch up before there are real gene edited enhanced babies because there are plenty of places in the world where science is being done without oversight, without peer review, and without taking other humans into consideration. And unfortunately, this is something that's happening. Doesn't need to be bad, but knowing this, we all need to take it upon ourselves to really, really focus on making sure that our knowledge can be translated, that our values can be translated, talk about these issues, put them out into the public sphere, and really get to the bottom of this, which is we want humans to be healthy, happy, and we want the technology that enables them to do that to be accessible to everyone. So thank you so much.